All right, gang, pushing on. We are on lecture number five. We're going to be looking at uh, solar energy and how it impacts our atmosphere. So we're going to talk about two different classifications of heat energy. <clears throat> I apologize. You've been hearing these terms as we've been going along. So some of this is going to be repetitive. Hopefully it helps it stick in your brain. It doesn't necessarily bore you to death, but that is what it is. We're going to look at the layer in the Earth atmosphere. Uh, general atmospheric density... Normally about a collapse rate and unusual twists. That's me lacking creativity. And problems that generate pollution. All right. So let's put the Earth and Sun in a little bit of perspective. Well, we've already been kind of done that with Earth-Sun relations, but this is just a cool fact. If the Sun's total energy output for one second was stored in some super-duper battery, it would take the U.S. over 9 million years to use it all. And that's because, right, the Earth is this tiny little thing 93 million miles away from this giant output of massive fusion energy. So the Earth generates, I'm sorry, the Sun generates a lot of uh, energy. Only a fraction of it hits our planet, but what does is not very important to us. Okay, we've been here before. Shore of energy comes in from the sun that heats us up. As our planet heats up, it generates long wave energy that then leaves. And if we have the same amount of energy leaving as long wave as the amount of short wave incoming, our planet will be in equilibrium and will be roughly the same temperature over time. That doesn't appear to be the case anymore. We appear to be heating up because we are keeping more of this long wave energy that's been trying to emit out into space. Okay, so we need to learn a little bit about the difference between what we're going to call shortwave energy and longwave energy. Shortwave energy is in this band in wavelengths. Wavelengths is measured in micrometers at a point that's obviously a very, very small distance. At uh, 0.5 micrometers, you basically have the blue color. Okay, and we're getting a lot of blue from the sun. That's what this other side of the graph is telling you. So in the visible colors, you guys see shortwave radiation in the color band. You don't see it all. Over here we have UV. Over here we have short uh, infrared. Um, but this is what we see. You see this band. You see around 0.5 to almost 1.0 micrometers in wavelength. And you distinguish those wavelengths based on color. Over here, where Earth emits energy out into space via heat, we call this long wave energy. You can't see this. This is energy you can't see. Your eyes will not detect this. So there's a difference. You can see short wave. You can't see long wave. And that's important. Okay, layers of the atmosphere. We'll start down here in the troposphere. This is where we live. This is where all our weather happens, storms, everything. Uh, as you get higher in the troposphere, temperatures cool off, right? When we go up to Flagstaff, we talked about this in the last lecture because there's fewer molecules. But up here in the stratosphere, you actually heat up. And that's because you have ozone up here in the stratosphere. Ozone is three uh, oxygen molecules combined. And it's very good at absorbing ultraviolet radiation, which is good. If this stuff wasn't here absorbing UV, nothing could live on the surface of our planet. Too much cancer. But because ozone's absorbing this UV, you get warmer in the stratosphere. Then up here in the mesosphere, you don't have any more UVs being absorbed. It cools off again. Ignore this. Just messing with your mind. And then we heat up again in the thermosphere because you're absorbing gamma rays and X-rays. But just to be clear, this... When I say it's warming up, it's it's not like it's balmy up here. You don't want to go hang out. There's hardly any air molecules up here at all. Let's put that into perspective. Uh, so here's that diagram again, but then let's consider the density of the atmosphere. So again, uh, down near the surface of the Earth, you got a lot of air molecules. Uh, it's, it can be warm because you have so many molecules that can absorb energy, and then it gets thinner as you get higher in elevation. So down here below Mount Everest, you have over 90% of the entire atmosphere. So it's obviously very, very thin as you get up here. You cool off as you get higher up until you hit the stratosphere. Then we warm up again because of the ozone layer. You cool off in the mesosphere. And then you warm up again in the thermosphere. But this is where you have meteors, auroras, less than 0.001% of the atmosphere. 
But this is our layering. This is, um, I don't know, what our atmosphere looks like. And just so you get a sense, like if you want to go fly in the space shuttle and go out to space, this is roughly where space is, is right here at the break between the mesosphere and the thermosphere. It's 50 miles up. Is considered. This is considered space. So that's how thin it is up here. But let's take a look at Kittinger's balloon. Okay, so somebody actually recently redid this. Uh, so more power to him because it's super cool. But Kittinger was at first, and he did this in the 60s. And what he did is he jumped out of a balloon from 102,000 feet up. And he's looking down on the tops of clouds up here. The guy's wearing a spacesuit. Uh, he accelerated to 614 miles per hour, which is basically the speed of sound. So he broke the sound barrier. Uh, awesome. You should definitely check out this video. It's really cool. It gives you a sense for, I don't know, the guy went up in this balloon, and if he didn't jump out, he, there was nobody's going to come up and save him. The guy had to jump. And his free fall was four and a half minutes, which is just, I don't know. Awesome. This gives you a sense for the uh, thickness of our atmosphere. Very, very thin up here. I mean, if, you, if you're looking out here to the right and you can see it in this video, it looks like space. Okay, adiabatics lapse rates. Now, this looks scary, but don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. And in fact, I'm even going to make these numbers easier. What we're going to do is don't worry about writing these numbers down in your notes. What you want to write down is as you go up 1,000 meters, not feet, as you go up 1,000 meters, you cool 5 degrees Celsius. I know it says 6.4. Ignore that. Put 5 in your mind. This is actually what reality is, but we're going to keep it uh, simpler for our math. So it's 5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. That's down here in the troposphere. As you get higher in the troposphere, down where we live, that's the rate at which we cool off, 5 degrees for every 1,000 meters. So this is kind of new, or not new, I don't know why I said that. This is kind of cool. Uh, you can get inversion layers. So typically we're supposed to be cooling off here, right? Five degrees for every thousand meters as we go up. But sometimes you get an inversion layer, where as you're going up, you actually warm up for a little bit, and then you cool off again. That can happen in this diagram. What they're trying to show is at night, cold air is going to pour off the mountains because cold air up in the mountains becomes very dense and it will flow like water downhill and it flows and it pours into the city. And as it pours into the city, the warm air that was here gets lifted up because the warm air is lighter. And so when the sun comes up, you have this warm air aloft, this inversion layer and cold air below. And what's neat is the cold air down here is not gonna mix with the warm air. The cold air is down here, it wants to be low, it's dense. The warm air is aloft. It's where it wants to be, it's aloft, it's up here. So the two don't mix and so you have Basically, pollution gets pretty bad as it moves up, hits its inversion layer, then moves off to the side. You've likely seen this before in your life. Um, anyway, super cool. Eventually, the sun rays will come down and it will heat up down here enough that you break through the inversion layer. So this is only something you tend to see in the morning. Here's some examples. This is fog, which is basically cloud on the ground, but it's colder down here in the valley than it is aloft and allowing you have the cloud. Here's another one over in the Himalayas. Here's another one. Here's an example of that fires going up, hits the inversion layer, and then the smoke goes out to the side. It can't go up because there's warm air right here. The air here is cold, air here is warm, and the two don't mix. Okay, we need to learn a little bit about smog. I don't expect you to know a ton, but the general idea is you take UV light and you impact car exhaust, the stuff that comes out of cars. Now, car exhaust isn't good stuff anyway. It's nitrogen dioxide, volatile organic compounds, um, and carbon monoxide. But when you bombard that with UV light and mix it with water, you're gonna get nitric acid, which is acid rain, that's not good. You're gonna take uh, atomic oxygen and mix it with O2 and generate ozone. Now, ozone's great up in the stratosphere where it absorbs UV light, but down here, ozone's super reactive, and so when you breathe it into your lungs, it gets very reactive in your lungs, and it's not, not cool, not good. We don't want it. That's pollution. That's smog. Uh, you can also get pans, and pans are when the volatile organic compounds and the nitric oxide that you end up with after you've lost one of your oxygens to ozone 
you generate things called pans, parasitical nitrates, and they're not they're not the worst things for you, but that's what gives smog that ugly brown color. Here's smog in Los Angeles. If you've been there, you know what this is like. And it's also smog in an inversion layer. So it's cold air down in Los Angeles. It's warm air aloft and it traps in that smog. So it doesn't allow that bad air to move up into the upper atmosphere. It stays down low. Here's another, man, ugh, definitely not the cleanest place to live. Uh, we're not immune to this. When we have our smog and we mix it with dust that we're famous for here in Phoenix, we get our nice brown gunky haze. We tend to get this more in the winter when the cold air comes down off the mountains or just chills at night and you end up with warm air aloft that generates smog. This is China. Ay ay ay. This place has the worst smog in the world. It actually is causing refraction in the atmosphere, making it look like you have two suns. Look at that. The sun's up in the sky and it looks this hazy. Our future, I doubt it, um, but still icky. Uh, la well, not last thing, but uh, I, you guys probably heard that uh, we're losing ozone in the stratosphere. Um, so it's the ozone hole. It's actually something that's getting a little bit better. Uh, CFCs, things that you basically use in hairspray and Aquanet and whatnot, um, get released in the upper atmosphere um, and all the populated continents. Once it gets up in the atmosphere, our entire planet really doesn't do anything but move stuff from the equator to the poles. We'll learn more about that later. But it brings all this pollution down towards the poles. And the CFCs react with ozone up in the uh, stratosphere and breaks it down, forming holes um, over the poles where there is no ozone. And so UV light just pounds through, and it's not good. You get huge increases in cancer rates as a result. Uh, luckily, very few things actually live on the North and South Pole, and the problem is getting better. All right, here's your things to know. The difference between short and long wave radiation, different layers of the atmosphere based on temperature. Uh, related to that, so this is related to it, the layers where solar energy is absorbed. That's your stratosphere and thermosphere. The normal abiotic elapse rate, what I want you to know is uh, it cools off five degrees for every thousand meters, five degrees Celsius for every thousand meters. How inversion layers develop and affect pollution. How solar energy interacts with car exhaust to generate pollution and the general cause and effect of ozone loss in the stratosphere. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.